a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. Right, exactly. And the house is a very, very, to the degree that any symbol is universal, the house is a pretty universal symbol for the, for the structure of the psyche. So, and it's no wonder they're afraid. There's reason to be afraid, you know, but it means embracing the horrors of the world. That's what it means. And that's not only the horrors of the world, but the evil of the world, you know. So there's the satanic tendencies that characterize you and to fully wrestle with them and to, and to integrate them. That's the thing. It's, it's not so much to cast them away. It's to transmute them. You know, and you can see the difference between people who've done that and people who haven't, at least to some degree, because people who haven't integrated the shadow at all are naive. And you can tell that when you look at them. And you, it's, it's, it's the potential for havoc. That's the right way of thinking about it. There's, a, there's an implicit potential for havoc, and that's really necessary. It, it's one of the things that gives people self-respect. This is an interesting thing about the integration of the shadow because recognizing yourself as the locus of evil, let's say, actually, in some sense, gives you far more respect for yourself, strangely enough, because the same respect that you might have for a wild animal or even a monster. It's like, and so then maybe you learn to treat yourself differently. Like, I, I think this is particularly true with regards to the discipline of children. You know, if you know that you're a monster and that that will manifest itself in your life, consciously or unconsciously, and if it's unconsciously, it's, it's, it's not good, then you become better at disciplining children. And the reason for that is that you don't want to expose them to your dark side. And so if they behave and don't provoke you, which means they'll also behave for other people, then you don't, the monstrous part can stay in abeyance. And then that's great. But if you don't understand yourself as capable of wreaking havoc, and that can be the kind of havoc that unfolds over decades, right? Because if you're going to abuse a child, it's the primitive form of abuse is the physical abuse. The sophisticated form of abuse is the continual undermining of the child's courage across perhaps their entire life. And that there's a terribly monstrous element to that. And if you're not respected properly by the child, say, you will absolutely take revenge on them. And, you know, maybe she's just been laid off. Maybe she went out and had too much to drink. Maybe she's hung over. You know, she's, she's angry and lonesome and she's overwhelmed by the responsibility of the children and she has a child who's testing and she doesn't know how to limit it. And one day the child tests at exactly the wrong time and it's like mayhem. And everybody goes, well, what happened? It's like, well, seven terrible things came together at the same time and produced this outburst of disintegrated rage and like look the hell out when that happens you know so yeah you you want to have that it, you it either, you either have that or it has you those are the options and you don't become safe by being castrated right that's not the right move forward you know one of the things about i think and one of the things about the way morality is taught is it's always taught like it's your it's your two it's always taught as if it's your grandma and her corset is too tight. You know, it's a hectoring sort of thing that you should be good. And the reason that you should be good is kind of for other people, you know, that it's a bunch of restrictions on you. And, and so you have to reduce yourself in order to be a good person. And that's, well, you might say that that's a prerequisite to discipline because I think in some sense it is, you know, that you do have to be molded and shaped. You know, Nietzsche believed that a long period of unfreedom had to precede a period of freedom, and that's something like discipline. But fundamentally, that's not the proper orientation because making everything work better is actually the most demanding task that you can take on. And it's not a matter of reducing yourself to a domesticated moral being, you know, like, like a, well, like a, like a fat pug dog, something like that, you know. It's, it's, it's a, it's a task that takes everything that you've got. And so you can use all of those darker forces, let's say, to 
be indomitable as you move forward and 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 you want a challenge because all of those forces are exactly the thing that is there for the challenge and so it becomes a matter of well it's a conversion of something that can be very dark into something that's a prerequisite for for light so if you take a tough 17 year old kid you know who's rebellious enough not to fit well into the you know the extra dom domesticated school systems that that we impose on our children you know most of my my friends because I lived in a working class town most of my friends dropped out of school before grade 10 and I wouldn't say it was the least admirable kids who dropped out you know these were guys who pretty much physically matured at 15 or 16 some of them were pretty big and strong and like they were done with putting up their hand to go to the bathroom they were just done with that and the fact that they left school you know it, it was a bad long-term decision maybe for many of them I mean a lot of them went and worked on the oil rigs and made a fortune but they never kept any of it but um, but they didn't drop out of school only for weakness and failure you know and so um, you there, there has to be, there, there has to be a challenge put forward to those people who are inclined in that aggressive, competitive direction, or they will fall prey to a life of pleasure seeking. You, there's no, you have no admiration for yourself if you live a life like that, right? It's there's contempt, there's self-contempt that's going to build, and, and, or, or engagement in things at a trivial level which isn't useful because in the final analysis whatever your life is it's not trivial the suffering makes it not trivial as a baseline you're stuck you're stuck with a certain number of profound experiences and all of them can be negative if you don't all of them can be negative if you let the default manifest itself but you don't get trivial because you have to encounter your own death and the death of everyone around you and, and the horrors of the world. And so there's no trivial response that doesn't subject you to that with no defense and then embitter you. So yeah, it's, I mean, there, there's a call to nobility in the, in the idea of imitation of the logos, but it's more than that. It's a call to something of well, the, hy the hypothesis is it's a call to something of cosmic significance. And I don't think that we have any right to assume that that idea is wrong. We don't understand our place in the cosmos. And, you know, if you, if you base your analysis on size, physical size, well, there are bigger things than us. But it's no, that's no, that's not a reasonable yardstick. There isn't anything that's more complex than us, not, not that we know of. So why not use that as a, as a marker? And, and there is something, there's an integral relationship between consciousness and being. And that isn't taken with sufficient seriousness by, by the materialist community. They have a real hard time with free will. And so their proclivity is to deny it but they act out the proposition that people have free will, including themselves, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to exist in society, because people aren't very happy when you treat them like they're not at least semi-autonomous agents. And so I don't think that that's fluke. I think that we are semi-autonomous agents. Now, we don't understand how that can be possible, but I'm not willing to say that it isn't the case merely because I can't explain it, especially when I observe that people accept it behaviorally as an axiomatic proposition. So they accept it as true. They can say they don't believe it, but it doesn't matter. Well, it depends on what you think you mean when you say believe. And for me, you act out what you believe, you know, and you're, your conscious, your, your, your cognitive, your capacity for abstraction can divorce itself from your embodied reality and go wherever it wants. It can even propose contradictory, it, it can propose a worldview that isn't in alignment with the manner of your embodiment at all. That happens all the time. 
it happens to everyone to some degree because we're not transparent to ourselves. But but well, you can it isn't so straightforward to determine what our place is in the in the world. And the thing that really got me with regards to that wasn't the good that we could do, but the harm that we can do. Because you can debate about the good we can do, but you cannot debate about the harm we can do. That's done. We know if we want to know. And I think my experience was when I took that seriously, which meant understanding how that was about me, you know, about that Auschwitz was about me and that the Stalinist camps were about me, then, well, that reorients you. That's a deep part of the shadow idea, right? I mean, and I think that is part of the idea of taking the sins of the world onto yourself. It's like you're a human being, so you see what human beings do, that's you. And you might say, well, I'd never do that. It's like, don't be so sure about that. In fact, you're, the probability that you're wrong is extraordinarily high. Well, that's yes, and I mean, it isn't self-evident that the default position is heroism in the face of the advance of evil. In fact, quite the contrary. So, it's highly probable that you would be on the side of the weak who are transformed into oppressors. And that's a very terrifying realization if you, if you take it seriously, which you should, and I do believe that we, if we don't take that with sufficient seriousness, we are not going to survive because we're too powerful to be naive. You know, and that was something that Jung insisted on, especially after the invention of the hydrogen bomb in particular. It's like, if you're going to play with fire, you better be a master of fire. I wasn't motivated to be serious until I knew what I was capable of in the most negative way. Because you don't take yourself seriously until you know that you can be, you are uh, an evil monster. And you don't take that seriously until you know what that means. And so, but once you know what that means, especially if you do it, if you find that out consciously, say, then you're in a position to start taking yourself seriously enough so that you might be willing to learn what you need to learn to become wise. You have to see yourself as an Auschwitz camp guard, and you have to see yourself enjoying it. And that can't just be an exercise in intellectual simulation, precisely. It has to be a dramatic experience. You have to feel that in your bones. And then you have to decide and you have to give the devil his due. There's something very attractive about predatory power. And you might even say that it's preferable to pathetic weakness. Now, I'm not saying that, but you could make a case that it is. Um, because you could say that the person who's pathetically weak would like to be a predatory tyrant, but just doesn't have the ability. And that's, well, that's a Nietzschean criticism of standard morality, I would say. But then, is there something higher than predatory power? Well, yes. I mean, part of, part of Christ's encounter with Satan in the desert is precisely that realization, because he's offered the kingdom of the world. And, and that means he's offered the option of tyrannical power. And his response to that is, there's something better. And that's wisdom there is something better. And there's no reason not to go for what is the best. What else? You don't have anything better to do than that by definition, right? So why not work for the betterment of being and abandon your resentment and your hatred of humanity and your self-contempt and, and take on the responsibility of the horrors and, and catastrophes of, of human existence and do what you can to, well, at least not make it worse, but maybe to make it better.
You know you can. You know you can make it worse and better. You just don't know how much. Find out. It might be way more than you think. I, I'm, I'm sure that's the case. So there isn't any more in interesting adventure than that. You know, find out how much good you can do in the world. And, and, not, in it, and not in this moralistic, thou shalt not weigh. But in a forthright, noble, courageous, eyes wide open, articulate, embodied manner. And then God only knows where we could get. So let's find out. That would be good. It's certainly better than the alternative. <laughs>